present a conversation with Professor G. Venkatraman, an eminent scientist who has had a brilliant scientific career for nearly four decades. Padma Shri Dr. G. Venkatraman is also the recipient of various awards, including Sir C. V. Raman Award of the UGC, Raman Centenary Medal, and Indira Gandhi Medal of Indian National Science Academy. He has authored various books, including a scientific biography of Sir C. V. Raman. He has also served as the Vice Chancellor of the Sri Satisa Institute of Higher Learning. In conversation with him is Mr. Ted Henry, a journalist from the United States of America. Dr. Jeevan Katraman, it is a pleasure to be sitting across the table from you, speaking to you on this program tonight. But I have to ask you, do you feel a little strange because normally you're the one asking all the questions? This is much easier on my side than it is on your side, isn't it? Do I? It's like an examiner sitting for an examination. <laughs> and I don't know what you're going to do with this table. All right. What's the toughest question you think I could possibly ask you about your life and about your spirituality? Do you think I'm going to leak that out? Not for money. <laughs> <laughs> You're a man of letters and a man of science, and I was always led to believe that uh, science and spirituality simply do not mix. Are you an uh, aberration there? What caused you to come into the world of both of these disciplines? Well, I'm glad you asked this question. I have to clarify some misconceptions here. Uh, I will leave out the philosophical aspect, but leaving, uh, staying with the purely human aspect, it's only a recent fashion that uh, scientists cough on spirituality. Uh, if you go back in history, you don't have to go too far back. If you just go up to, say, Newton and Galileo, let's take Newton. I don't know whether you know, Newton wanted very much to be a priest. Did not know that. And he was a great believer in God. And uh, he always was amazed by the power of God. For example, uh, he believed in absolute space, a concept in physics. But of course, now we know there is no absolute space. There is uh, only absolute space-time. That came with Einstein. That's a different story. But the point is, he said, you must have absolute space, otherwise it won't be consistent with divinity. And similarly, he looked at the thumb and said, thumb alone is enough to prove the existence of God. And uh, it was, Newton was not an a isolated singularity, as we say in mathematics. He was not an exception. That was the kind of feeling that prevailed. And uh, here you must note that till the Renaissance, you know, there was no separate uh, philosophy and science. In fact, even today you get a PhD. That's a degree in philosophy, natural philosophy. Mm -hmm. Later on, they started to part company. There are many historical reasons for that. But just to mention another person, I think it was Maupertuis but I can't be 100% sure. He was the first fellow to discover the principle of what we call least action. And he said, uh, God ordained it this way. So everybody invoked God or, and uh, attributed the laws of nature to God. As late as the 1920s, Werner Heisenberg, he was a young man then, he discovered the, he made one of the profoundest discoveries of that century, 20th century, at 3 o'clock in the morning, he discovered the laws of quantum physics for the first time. And uh, he re later wrote a letter to his sister saying, I felt as if I was looking over the shoulders of the Lord as he was composing the symphony of the universe. Mm. And he was a Nobel Prize winner. I won't give a long list, but I'll just jump to Charles Towns, professor from Columbia who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the, princip uh, the principle of the maser and the laser, he said science explains the how of the universe and spiritual philosophy and religion explain the why of the universe. When did you become so interested in the why? Okay, my case is somewhat different. For the simple reason, I led a double life, so to say. Oh. <laughs> you see, born in India... And having been born in a traditional family, one gets exposed to sort of religion. And uh, I was given a lot of books as a small boy that related to our epics, which I read and I liked. 
The second thing was, uh, and uh, the God that I liked very much was Lord Rama, who stood for truth and righteousness. He was an ideal person, and uh, he naturally inspired a lot of uh, admiration. And he was widely worshipped. And uh, Gandhi was very much around when I was a small boy, and he used to adore Rama. In fact, he died with the name of Rama on his lips. So Rama became very acceptable, particularly because of Gandhi. But when I started my scientific career, I sort of, you know, would think of God at times and science at times. And of course, uh, there were periods when one began to wonder about certain aspects. But uh, later on, as one grew up and one became older and wiser, shall I say, I realized that, uh, as Baba says, Science is only one half of the story, and spirituality is the missing half. Mm. And unless you have all of it together, you don't get the whole picture. Let me ask you one question about Gandhi. <laughs> Since you brought up his name, uh, if I recall correctly, it was around 1935, 37, he was talking to a reporter from a London newspaper, and he made the, he made the comment that my life is my message. Somebody else makes that comment a whole lot, too. What significance does Satya Sai Baba have in your life? You're going to need more than half an hour for me to explain that. But uh, let me put it very crisply. I think Satya Sai Baba not only has transformed me, but he has made my life meaningful. I went around doing all sorts of things. I got a kick out of it too, some of it at least. Sometimes the events kicked me, but that's a different story. But I did not realize the answer to certain basic questions. You know, Stephen Hawking ends his book, uh, I think it's called the something to do with time. I don't remember the exact title. The, his, the History of Time? Yes, I think uh, that's it. It was on New York Times bestseller and all that sort of thing. He ends the book with some questions like, uh, we don't know why the universe is there, and what our relationship to it, and so forth. I found the, those questions very interesting because spiritual philosophy began thousands of years ago when man began to ask those questions. You see, ancient man lived under the canopy of the stars. So he saw nature and he began to wonder using the gift that God had given to him. Now we live in houses, we shut the windows, we shut the doors, we put curtains, and all we see is the roof and the television screen, so we don't wonder. We don't even have to think. Somebody else thinks for us. But ancient man was not like that. And he asked the very same questions. Where did all these things come from? Where did I come from? How do I relate to this? We are still left with those questions. That is because we are not paying attention to the answers to those questions that have been discovered by wise men in different parts of the world. Satya Sai Baba made me realize what those answers were and made me reflect and understand many things. And also he made me realize the real purpose of human life. The real purpose of human life, as I now see it, is to recognize the divinity in man. And this is something that has been recognized by many religions. They all say God made man in his own image. Well, if God is divine, then man has to be divine too if he is the image of God. It takes effort to make a transformation that you just alluded to. And by your own admission, you got a kick out of life when you were the old Dr. Ventraman. What about the person I see before me today? Why did you decide to make the effort to undergo the transformation when you were perfectly content, it sounds like, before? Well, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I would say I did not make the effort. It was divinely ordained. You see, I had a couple of major setbacks in life. And uh, as one of our saints says, it's only when you are miserable you think of God. When the going is good, you take all the credit and say, God has no business to share my credit. <laughs> of course, I didn't say that. But uh, God is out of your radar screen when you are uh, happy. But when you're miserable, you start thinking of God. And, uh, well, one thing led to another, and I came here. I saw Bhagwan, 
I was, uh, a spell was cast over me. I went through all the euphoria of the beginner. But then the scientist in me got, uh, came up and I began to pay serious attention to his discourses. I read a lot here, there, everywhere, things that I had never read before. And I began to reflect because that's what you do in science. You know, you read someone else's paper and you try to find out whether he's right or wrong. If he's right, you say, can I better him? If he's wrong, you try to demolish him. <laughs> of course, that's the way the game is played. But here, I tried to understand what he said. And it not only made a lot of sense to me, but it also told me how I could use the remaining part of my life by being useful to humanity. And here, one sentence of Victor Weisskopf profoundly influenced me. Victor Weisskopf was an Austrian physicist who went to America in the early 30s, running away from Hitler, of course. He worked in the U.S. atom bomb project in Los Alamos, but later on, he, later on he was professor in MIT, and he was a very good, distinguished physicist, a very cultured European. And addressing the American Association for the Advancement of Science, he said, "Knowledge without compassion is inhuman, and compassion without knowledge is ineffective." Mm. So he said, "I'm supposed to have some scientific knowledge." Do I want to be inhuman or <laughs> human? <laughs> well, the ch choice was obvious, especially being in Bhagwan Baba's proximity. And I have tried to use whatever time I have and whatever talents God has gifted to me in the service of humanity in manners that I thought were uh, useful and within my scope. I've recognized firsthand some compassion here before my very eyes, lots of knowledge as well, and a fair amount of love. But then I've been here several times. You know as well as I do that there are people hearing this all over this planet, perhaps, who are hearing Sai Baba's name for the first time. Mm -hmm. Who is Sai Baba? That's a good question. In fact, uh, he himself has raised this question and answered it in a discourse many years ago. Well, it all depends at what level you are looking for an answer. If you are looking for an answer at the purely newspaper level, I would give a biographical thumbnail sketch. Sai Baba is a person born in the family on 23rd November 1926 <laughs> in a remote village where there were just 100 people and so on and so forth. That doesn't cut That it. doesn't. Uh, I would say, if you are asking me to describe Bhagwan Sri Satya Sai Baba, I would say, in purely human terms, he is pure love personified <laughs> and all the ramifications of pure love, such as compassion, such as forbearance. Sternness at times? You see, sternness is a put on. It's not, he, is not, he can't be stern. That is just, uh, you know, like the father chiding the son. Uh, father can't stop loving his son, nor the mother. But, you know, sometimes a little bit of admonition is necessary. So I wouldn't put too much uh, emphasis on the stern. Incidentally, that reminds me, this is uh, something you might like to hear. This happened many, many years ago. A group of uh, singers who were in Vietnam, they were entertaining the troops. The Vietnam War was on. They had a little break. They could take a few days off for rest and recuperation and for some strange reason, they decided to come to Bangalore to see Sai Baba instead of going to Bangkok or Hong Kong, which was the places, which are the places people normally went to. And uh, they had a lot of experiences. And uh, the interesting thing is, there was one man there who was the head of the group. Baba always appeared to scowl at him. To scowl. Scowl. Okay. A look, you know, as though he was annoyed and angry and all that. Well, I've seen that look. <laughs> well, there are pictures of well, that. I tried correct. to avoid it, shall I say. <laughs> <laughs> but this fellow was not taken in. Six, seven days, this game went on. And then uh, one day, Baba asked him, you don't think I'm angry with you? And that man coolly replied, I don't think you're angry with me, but you're acting as though you're <laughs> angry with me. How can you be angry? You don't know what anger is. And Swami had a big laugh and said, that's true. That's my real self. And you have pierced through the veil. I've seen his self as a prankster, as a jokester, with great humor. How much of that do you see on a regular basis? Because you're around him so often. 
You see, it all depends. Uh, you see, different people see different aspects of Baba. As he says, when I'm with a child, I'm like a child. When I'm with a man, I'm with a man, and so on. You know, what happens is that uh, when people come from other places, they come with all kinds of expectations. So he gives them happiness through these kind of experiences. Uh, when you are near him and you're working for him, he does not give much time for these things to us. Occasionally, yes. But most of the time, we find our happiness by quietly working for him mm -hmm. and knowing that he knows it all. We don't tell him, nor does he ask us. Have you personally been able to penetrate that veil of who Sai Baba really is? Well, I don't know whether I can answer that question in entirety because I know in my head that he is an incarnation of God. That I know by logical reason and all that. But I believe as a human being that's not enough. I must feel that in my heart. Then only I can say I have penetrated through the veil. There are times when I feel that way. There are times when I can't say for sure that I feel that way. Just maybe my mind is wandering and my heart is not tuned up or something like that. But in my heart of hearts, I do know that he is an incarnation, that he is pure love, that he is compassion. Dr. Venkatraman. That uh, I have no doubt of. There are six billion and counting people on this earth. He's been around for almost 80 years. If he is that and more of how you just described him, why does such a tiny handful of people, relatively speaking, know his name? As far as knowing his name is concerned, I think I can answer that. It's mainly because he has never sought publicity and he does not allow publicity. So the, if you started using the media in the pu means of uh, publicity, his name would be known far more than it is now. But let us not forget, even without this, he has touched innumerable hearts in innumerable countries. There are countries from where people have not come, like Cuba, but he's mm. known there. I have heard Leonard Gutter telling me that there are something like 20,000 followers of Sai Baba in Cuba, including the brother of Fidel Castro. How do they become aware of Sai Baba? Okay, he has got his own methods. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember the detail, but somebody sent a picture or a letter there mm -hmm. and then the word spread. You see, it is like this. This has happened time and again. And I'll give you one classic example, in my opinion. If you have a feeling in your heart for God, it doesn't have to be Sai Baba. And he, he says that pretty much. He says that. And it has happened to a number of people. He reaches out to you. It has happened again and again. Take the case of James Sinclair. He was recorded in first person. Mm -hmm. He didn't know anything about Sai Baba, but he always used to tell himself, how come I'm living 2,000 years late? Why was I not around when Christ was there? Mm -hmm. There was a deep yearning in him. And Swami brought him to, brought James Sinclair to him. And this sort of thing has happened to many people. Let me get back to the uh, thing that I wanted to tell you. Look at Russia. Ten years ago, there was hardly a single Russian here. Today there are many. So many. In fact, at times, you find more Russians here than anyone else. There are more Russians than Americans today, right now. That's right. This period. And uh, what had happened was uh, there was a deep hunger somewhere in the hearts of these people for God. And I believe Baba told somebody just at the time perestroika and all were breaking up, uh, coming into the picture, the big black cloud over Russia is lifting. And when it lifted, there was a vacuum and they looked here and there and those who were yearning for him came here. And for everyone who comes here, there are at least 100 there who are unable to come. And we have heard stories of that. So my answer to your question is, if there is yearning for God, he will reveal himself in some way or the other at the right time. Mm -hmm. 
There seems to be uh, a, a threshold of awareness in the West, particularly in America. Uh, not so long ago, there was one article in the International Herald Tribune. There was a Sunday article, half page in the New York Times. I have to uh, imagine that there are untold thousands, if not millions of people who are seeing his name in print, seeing his picture in the paper for the first time. Are you ready to have the gates made bigger to accommodate the throngs of people coming to see Sai Baba? I don't have to make it bigger. <laughs> the gates would collapse <laughs> if they come. I think uh, the already in India, whenever Baba goes to any place, huge crowds come. I've seen this personally in the year 1999, I think. I had the pleasure and the privilege and the blessing of going with him to first Delhi and then to Bombay. It was a seven-day trip. He had to give darshan in the biggest stadium in India, the Nehru Stadium, which was built for the Asian Games. I mean, you that's the place where 100,000 people can Huge. sit in the track and field events would be could be conducted there. And the people sitting in the playing area, people sitting in the gallery. And there is a tremendous amount of hunger for him. It has been so for a number of years. And uh, I think uh, uh, people will be drawn to him in due course when the time is right. You've talked about uh, atheists and people who've had no religion for many, many years being drawn to Baba now from Cuba, from from Russia. Of course, uh, there's millions of uh, people here from from India who are extraordinarily fond of him. I'm also aware that the the prime minister of India, who's a Hindu, is a Sai Baba uh, a devotee, an admirer, an affirmer of Sai Baba, that the president, who is uh, a Muslim, feels the same way. Talk to me a little bit about his ability to unite people from various religious backgrounds, which makes him unique. See, that's very simple. He doesn't talk religion. He talks the language of the heart. That's all. Uh, the best way of uh, describing this, uh, or rather explaining this, is to recall what one Mr. Wellington told us some years ago in a speech that we, he gave here. Mr. Wellington, uh, I should mention, is a Christian, of course. He hails from the state of Kerala. And he was a member of the communist government. The first time a communist uh, government was ever installed through the ballot. That happened in Kerala. And uh, they came to power through the ballot, not through the bullet. And he was a member of that cabinet. And he was the health minister. Baba went to Kerala. And uh, it so happened he had to bless a hospital. And this man had to come there as the minister. So he didn't like it one bit because A, he was a communist and B, he was supposed to be a Christian. But somehow he came and he was charmed and he decided to see Baba here. So he came here and as he entered the gate, he felt that he was in a Hindu atmosphere. So he was getting turned off. But Baba called him for an interview. And the first thing he said was, Wellington... Be a good Christian. Mm. Not a Christian, but a good Christian. And this man was stunned. Baba was not trying to convert him. Baba always says, I want to sustain people in their own faith and make them deepen their faith. That is a particular pathway to God. Why do you have to switch tracks? There's no need to. And that is what endears him to people from different religions, particularly from Iran. I have seen big groups come. They come, he gives them interview after interview, and they say, Baba, we want to sing bhajans. So he arranges for them to sing bhajans. And all their bhajans are on Allah. And we all, of course, we don't know, so we can't follow. But we sit and listen. Mm -hmm. For half an hour it goes on. So he, he has no sort of divisive feelings. In fact, if you go out into the village, you will see a mosque. That mosque was constructed by him. Because the people of this village had to go to Bukapatnam, which was six Muslims of this village, which is six kilometers away. And they found it very difficult. So he said, don't worry, you don't have to walk that long. I'll give you a mosque. He has given a mosque. Hmm. And uh, he, he just doesn't bother about these things. Some years ago, he ma there was a mass marriage where marriages were conducted for people who could not afford the expenditure. I was present. It was on the occasion of his 70th birthday. There were Christians. There were Muslims. Muslim priests came. They did the marriage according to their custom. There are Chris Christian uh, priests. They conducted marriages according to their custom. And uh, the Hindus, of course, were the majority. They conducted marriages according to their custom. 
he just doesn't care about the f- procedural details mm-hmm. so he says my language is language of the heart and my religion is religion of love so they, there's no problem only we have problem he doesn't have problem <laughs> uh, the people i've met around here are fairly attached to the form of sai baba i would imagine you're no exception to that and i i'm guessing that you probably work at his request what if he told you to suddenly go into the world and work again go back from where you came go to delhi go to bombay uh, would you be able to do that easily uh, if he wanted you to just be yourself apart from here uh, let me answer your question in two parts first i hope he won't ask me to do that <laughs> <laughs> but but if he asked me to do that i would obey his command unflinchingly because my duty is to do what he says and hope that he'll be pleased with what i do so as far as i am concerned i have no hang ups on that but uh, different people are made differently i attach a lot of importance baba says often you must obey divine commands implicitly if that is given to me as an order i will definitely do it i have no doubts about that maybe i'll cry a little bit but that's a different thing you I have got a hanky put- around so i can manage you you probably have shed a few tears around sai baba for the simple reason that you seem to be in the in the in the wonderful position of being fortunate enough to be around him so much How would you describe him as a man, the the human feature of Sai Baba that you see so often? You see, Baba himself has described this, or rather answered your question, shall I say. You can be very close and totally miss him. You can be very far and you can be very close to him. Supposing I'm here and I sit there in Darshan and I see him come. Okay, he comes, he takes a few letters, uh, gives vibhuti to somebody and talks to somebody. I look at it purely as a newspaper reporter. I don't observe. It's like Watson. So you can be Watson or Holmes. If you're Watson, you're looking at it purely from the worldly point of view. Mm. But if you're Holmes, you do a much more closer watch and you also infer. Let me give you an example of what I mean. he comes he comes ever so slowly he glides he stops and he talks to people there are two reasons he why, why he does this he talks to make that person happy and he stays there to talk so that people in that neighborhood can see him more closely this is something that people don't appreciate they can see him smile joke and they you know also derive a lot of pleasure out of it and uh, he spends this way nearly 20 to 25 minutes and thousands of people can see him that's what they have come for mm-hmm. from long distances so even though he doesn't talk to you you see him for 25 minutes it charges you the other thing is this i have noticed many times and that's really what confirmed his divinity to me personally he comes with a wonderful smile and he stands there talking even if he doesn't st- talk to a person as he goes past i've seen the live faces of people light up there is an extraordinary effulgence that gets switched off the moment he goes and that effulgence convinces me that there is divine in those people i mean these are people with a sort of rough look mm-hmm. or tough look whatever you I've want to call that. it but then when he is there they change completely my god it's not possible for a ordinary human being to do the other thing is sometimes he will stand there and look at infinity it is as if all the people in front of him have dissolved they become one and he is one with them he is in a different state all by himself and he has drawn into that himself all the people in front of him i have seen that then suddenly you'll snap out of it and start talking to somebody so you see divinity at the practical level and or more or less at the abstract level and therefore It's all a question of how you look at him. As he says, if you look at God with a human eye, you will see a human being. If you see God with a divine eye, you will see the divine. And that applies not only to the form of Sai Baba, but even nature. I remember many years ago, I was in the Himalayas in a place called Gulmarg in Kashmir. I was there. There was a Christian with me. He was an architect working in our department. And he looked at all those wonderful snow-capped mountains, mountains and the meadows at the lower levels. And he said... gosh we don't need to build a church this is the greatest church mm-hmm. and it's been built by god yeah. so he was not looking at mountains he was not looking at the snow he was looking 
at God. So if you look at God, then you will see God. If you look at him as man, you will see only man. I think it's a matter of perception and uh, your, your conditioning and your attitude. You I don't know whether you agree with me, but that's no, I do. In fact, I'm intrigued still, but I want to go back to the uh, the premise of this conversation about you being a scientist. Because in addition to looking at Baba with your eyes, you hear his words with your ears, and you process them as a scientist. You process them as a, as an educated being. Somewhere along the line. You made the switch to seeing Baba more with your heart, though, than hearing his words with your ears. Did that come naturally for you? Did you have to work at that? Well, I hope so. I, I thought I was a human being first and then... then well, only so many of us are just... so distracted by every the mysteries of life that we can become obsessed just by that alone you see, and miss the feeling uh, uh, of Let life. me tell you, the, the people get obsessed with science uh, for two reasons. One is... It gives them a chance to be in the limelight. The other is... The well, that thrill. can go for any profession. Yes, yes. Uh, but particularly, a uh, lot of people get into science because, you know, you, you, you compete with very intelligent people and so on and so forth. And then making discoveries. But uh, there are people who get tired of it after a while. And as far as I was concerned, I always had a sort of... Uh, uh, social side to me. I was always disturbed by poverty. I was always disturbed by uh, cruelty, animality of man, and so on and so forth. Because, you know, we had grown up under Gandhi, so to say. So the problems of humanity always bothered me. It is not as if science always uh, took number one precedence in my attention. The problems of humanity always bothered me. And there came a time when I said, okay, I have to blend these two together to the extent possible. And if one overtakes the other, fine, there's no problem about it. Uh, so I have not uh, really regretted when I stopped uh, research. And in fact, even in my scientific career towards the end, I was grooming people much more than I was doing science. Mm. And what I did was I always tried to gr instill the importance of values. Avoid upmanship, be true to yourself, integrity, character, these things I stress. And I was very happy to find that many of these people would meet me years later and thank me for being mm -hmm. tough with them in the early days. Well, Baba seems to be sending out ambassadors of all those qualities now to points all over the world. The Psy students that I've come to meet as adults are now beacons of light in their community in the West in America. And, and that's something we haven't seen taught in many of our schools for quite some time. Those values seem to catch a very little attention, regrettably. Well, that's because our priorities have changed. I mean, uh, after all, I have read stories of George Washington standing up for truth without being afraid of punishment. And uh, if you listen to Baba's discourses regularly, you would be amazed at the number of times he mentions Abraham Lincoln. Mm. So if two people are frequently mentioned in the dispatches, they're two they are Buddha and uh, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> in fact, they figure more often than Christ. <laughs> because these are, you know, classic cases. Yes. I, I want to ask you a question about the the, the, the good works of Satya Sai Baba, the, the hospitals, which are almost beyond description for the person who hasn't seen them, uh, the schools, the education system, the water purification projects. I'm guessing there's no way on earth even Baba can meet these needs universally. Is the purpose behind these works to serve as a model for others to carry on if the people of India can do this with very little money and do it so successfully? Is that the purpose of why he's putting so much attention towards this to serve as a model for others? See, there are a number of reasons. I can't uh, second guess him, but I can say there are some obvious lessons to be learned. The first is that uh, you must be selfless in anything that you do, whether it's small or big. If there is a tinge of selfishness, then there is a chance of failure. But if it is totally selfless, then there's a very great chance that will succeed. A selfless person is full of love. And love is far more powerful than we recognize it to be. And I would say these projects 
a demonstration of the power of love. It's not just the hospital or the water project or this or that. And there are so many of these things. He wants to show that the way to solve problems is through love and not any other method. Conflict will certainly not solve problems. It may shell the problem. It may sweep it under the rug. It may keep it supposedly under control, but it would erupt later with greater violence. He says he is not about being a religion, that his is the religion of love. I hear that word over and over again, but I'm guessing that's the most difficult four-letter word for most humans to understand, including myself, what love means. You're talking about acting selflessly. I don't know too many people who can do that. You see, we have lost practice, and so we think it's impossible. But in a small measure, we we don't uh, we are all alive because of selfless love. We don't realize that. Let me put it this way. I thought about this a long time. You see a newborn baby. That newborn baby cannot survive unless the mother is prepared to get up in the middle of the night and feed it, clean it, take care of it, and so on and so forth. That is selfless love in action. That is really God's love for man. You and I would not be alive if our mothers hadn't done it. And every mother on earth is doing it all the time from the beginning of the human race. But we don't pay attention to it. Somehow other factors come and eclipse this. Life goes on because of love and it's not confined to humans. You look at a tigress, how it protects the cub. A cat, how it protects the kittens. God has built this into living beings. Kindness, compassion, and love. Of course, it appears in distorted forms. But now what we are trying to do is we are literally trying to edge it out. That's our problem. Baba says, no, keep it alive. How much longer do you continue to serve in a variation on that theme, in that capacity, before you decide to simply retire and enjoy the fruit of your achievements over so many years? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Just before I retired from service, I came to Baba and said, I want to come here and work. He said, you're not retiring. I'm going to retire you. <laughs> so with Baba... <laughs> retire you. Yes. You don't take a vacation. <laughs> he he put, doesn't take any vacation. He puts a new tread on you. Yeah, he, 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 he doesn't take any vacation. He says, change of work is rest for me. And uh, actually, you know, I now have no encumbrances. I'm all by myself. I have no particular agenda of my own. And my only complaint is he has given me only 24 hours a day. <laughs> so I don't think he can ex- extend it a little longer. Because if, like Einstein, I can travel, uh, like Einstein says, I can travel at the speed of light, I can make 24 hours last longer. <laughs> but I can't do that. I have to be where I am and do my work. I feel enormous strength and pleasure and happiness in doing his work. So why should I trade it in? I'm not going to trade it in by no means, no way. Let me ask you a leading question. So you can't give me a ticket to Hawaii. I, no <laughs> I was going to say, might, <laughs> no, be these be, might these be the happiest days of your lives or, or, or of your life, or, or could you be sent to Paris or Hawaii and find greater happiness? No. I would say, as I told someone else, these are the best years of my life. They the are. quote from the title of a movie, I think Frederick Marsh uh, starred in it. Yes. I would unhesitatingly say these are the most uh, useful years of my life. I know who I am finally. I know what I am doing. I know why I am doing it. I know for whom I am doing it. And I am grateful to God for giving me this opportunity. Well, then uh, let me. If uh, he sends me to Hawaii to do some work, <laughs> you will find me there doing work, not on the beaches. <laughs> then let me give you one last test question as our time's running out. And, and you said it was okay how, how if I How do you think I'm scoring so far? Oh, <laughs> you'll you keep scoring. that a secret. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know when you answer this last question. If these truly are the best days of your life, if you wouldn't trade places with anyone else on the face of the earth, I think you kind of said that by extension, then for the person hearing about this place called Uttaparti, Prashanti, Nilayam, Satya, Sai Baba. What's the most important thing you could say right now that would help people understand why this transformation has occurred to you, making this the most important time of your life? Well, I would say that um, I was made to realize who I really am. I'm a human being. I've got to live like a human being. 
and Baba has given a definition of a human being. He says a human being is one with a heart. And for heart, he uses the Sanskrit word hridaya. And he says hridaya is hrit plus daya. And daya is the Sanskrit word for compassion. So unless your heart is overflowing with compassion, you're not a human being. And I would say, Puttapati is telling the world now, discover your heart, discover the compassion, and let it flood all over your body, and let it flow out through your body in acts of love, selfless love, that is. Dr. Venkatraman, you do very well on that side of the microphone. I think you should stay there for a <laughs> few more years. Thank you very much for yes, your... Yes, but not answering questions. <laughs> this is almost like a Senate hearing. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank being you. with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. And a You're... change. I would now like to know my score. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> no, you get 101. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm sorry.